Okay, he's the founder of Leap Leadership Academy in St. Grand Bernhard. He has deep passion for helping people to improve their competencies and the skills in leadership and communication. Johan has various industries experience, ranging from manufacturing industry, security industry, and education industry. Starting his career as an engineer, he further explored his career in marketing and business development before becoming a professional trainer, which he believes he can help even more people to be more successful in life, hence contributing to the organization and the nation as a whole. He's a certified Directive Communication International Trainer. He's a certified trainer under the Human Resources Development Fund, HRDF. He's also an NLP practitioner and an accelerated learning instructor. He is currently the Vice President of Education of Malaysian Association of Professional Speakers, an association that's affiliated with the Global Speakers Federation and a professional member of American Institute of Business Psychology. He has trained hundreds of organizations from corporates, government, agencies, SMEs, and institutions. He believes that leadership is not about position, leadership is about passion. And people with passion can change the word world for, uh, for better. Let us all give a thundering applause for Inche Johan Irwan. How many of you want to be a better leader? leader? Okay, how many of you want to lead effectively in the 21st century? Thank you. My name is Johan Irwan and leadership has been part of my passion. And for the past few years, I've been studying about what makes great leaders great. And in this session for about 45 minutes, I'm going to share with you about leadership and how do we lead effectively in the 21st century. But before that, I would, I would just want to ask you, how many of you have goals in life? Thank you, almost all of you. Another question, how many of you, when you set goals, you always achieve your goal? Always 100%. Okay, some of you, and majority are not. So I would like to share with you some of these organizations that initially they started for one objective, but throughout the years, they changed. How many of you have used this phone called Nokia? Wow, oh, some of you. Okay, Nokia, uh, do you know what Nokia initially started as? What company? Paper company. Nokia started as a paper mill and then they changed throughout the year become mobile phones. Okay, who knows what everyone initially started as? They sell what? They sell books. They sell books. And along the way, they discovered that cosmetic is their business. Tiffany and Co. How they initially started? <laughs> they started with selling stationery. <laughs> and Coca Cola. Oh, how they initially started? Manson and Manson started as a pharmaceutical company. And now, if you drink too much of Coca-Cola, you have to go for a pharmaceutical company. Yeah? <laughs> and what are the common things of all these companies? They changed. They didn't end up where they started. And my life is also been through this journey. I started off my life as an engineer. I started my career as an engineer. And it's, I discovered that engineering is not something that I am passionate about and I change, now I become an engineer as a professional speaker, a trainer. And today I'm going to talk about leadership. But before we go into the topic of leadership, why leadership is important? Why is it important? John C. Maxwell, one of the leadership gurus that being shared also by Colleague this, this morning, John C. Maxwell, he said that everything rises and falls on leadership and he continues by it's not something it is not most of the thing but it is everything. everything everything so if you look at a country how a country prospers because of they have a good leader 
and why a, a, a civilization can fall down because of they have a bad leader. So everything rises and falls on leadership. To me, leadership is the most important thing because of if you have good people but you have bad leaders, that bad leaders can turn these good people into bad people, bad performer. And I, I just want to share with you in the book of John C. Maxwell, the 21 irrefutable laws of leadership. The first law he mentioned about the law of the lead. How many of you do know what is lead? Okay, some of you don't know what is lead. Okay, lead is like when you, uh, uh, for example, if you have a dustbin and you have a cover, that's a lead. Lead in, a, in, in a, other words, lead is the ceiling. So if you have a lead, means that you cannot grow off the lead. So that's the lead. And his theory about leadership lead is every one of us have our levels of leadership. For example, maybe some of you level 5, some of you level 7, some of you level 3. And because of we have these various levels, that's how we will be our effectiveness of leading. I'll give you an example. Have you ever met someone that when you talk to them, you feel like you are so small and they are so big? Even though you have this good idea, great idea, but somehow it's very difficult for you to convince him because of this different level. Some people say aura, some people say charisma, but they have, to me, they have a higher lead. And at the same time, you meet another guy, you think that you don't know nothing about the subject. But when you talk to this person, you feel like you're so big and they're so small. Okay, how to explain this? The first guy actually has a little bit higher lead than you, and the second guy has a little bit lead lower than you. So, as a leader, it is very easy for me to convince the person B, but it is challenging for me to convince person A because of they have higher lead. So that is in a nutshell. And John C. Maxwell said that a company, an organization, can only grow at the level of the leader's lead. So for example, like if I have leadership lead level number five, my organization cannot exceed level five. Can be level four, can be level three, but cannot be at level six. So how do I grow my business? Or how do I grow my chapter? When you talk about in a chapter, your leaders will meet your level of effectiveness of your chapter. So if you have leaders at level five, then your chapter cannot grow more than five. So how do I go to level six or level seven? How do I go? Great. Change the leader. That is the easiest thing to do. If we look at any companies, if the company is underperforming, what do we do? Sack the CEO and change with the new CEO. And then the company can move. Same goes to a country. If you see the leaders not performing, no, I'm not talking about the country. Right? <laughs> you ask, you're talking about yes. <laughs> okay, we change the leader and then the company will prosper. But if you have leader at level three, then the company is very difficult to grow. We look at how many of you learn history here? History? Malaysian history? Do you familiar with uh, Sejarah Melaka? Melaka. You know Melaka, right? Faram is one to me, they got a very, he got a very high lead. That's why Melaka can grow and grow and grow and prosper. But towards the end, they have this Sultan, Sultan Kunur, who's that? the last Sultan for the Empire Melaka? Sultan Mahmud, eh? Sultan Mahmud, Mangkat the Gulam, you read history, eh? My personal opinion, Sultan Mahmud have a very low lead. And because of the he got a very low lead, that's why enemies can easily conquer the whole country, the whole nation, the whole civilization. The same goes to your chapter. The only way for us to grow our chapter is to have a higher lead leader, to have a better leader. So there are two suggestions, eh? there are two ways. First, we change the leader. Easy! Someone not performing, change the president, change the CEO or whatever, replace with new one. Or there are second way, which is grow your leader. If you are the leader, you have to grow yourself so that if, let's say, I'm at level five, I can grow level six, level seven, and my organization 
can grow at level number seven. So let's look at some of the examples here. Eh? Okay, let's look at this, uh, just a little bit of theory. If my level of effectiveness is at level one, I can put dedication at level eight. I put a lot of effort, I put a lot of commitment. But because of my level is at level number one, my effectiveness overall is eight. Simple math, right? But if I grow myself, now I am at level six. So my effectiveness is now at 48. Six times uh, eight is 48. So this is a result of growing your leadership ability. And if you look at some of the great organizations like McDonald's, how many of you know McDonald's? Okay, who's the founder of McDonald's? McDonald's Brothers! The founder of McDonald's is McDonald's, huh? The founder of McDonald's is McDonald's Brothers. But for so many years, McDonald's Brothers have been uh, cooking burgers and they tried to grow their organization but they failed. Until this guy, this gentleman named Ray Kroc, saw some opportunities, saw some potential in that organization. So he came and bought over the company with a higher lead. And that's how McDonald's grew because they have a very good leader. And if you look at another example, Apple. How many of you are a fan of apples? <laughs> trick, 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 no. <laughs> okay, Apple fans. Okay, Apple was co-founded by who? Steve? Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. They are two Steve as a co-founder. But Steve Wozniak had these great products, but just left on the table. Because of Steve Wozniak, don't see something. And until Steve Jobs said, let's do something about this. And actually, Steve Jobs bring a higher lead into that organization. And after working for so many years, Apple grew at a very high, fast pace, fast rate. And until 1983, they wanted to launch their latest product, which is Mac, Macintosh. And Steve Jobs said, the board of directors said, Steve, you can't beat this because of you are not capable enough. So we need a leader from outside. And they hire another leader. They hire this guy named John Scully, who is the CEO of Pepsi Cola. And CEO of Pepsi Cola at that time was the, one of the in-trend leaders. Eh? He appeared in magazine because of, you know Pepsi and Coca-Cola, they have this battle. Which one is better, Pepsi or Coca-Cola? And during his time, John Scully's time, Pepsi Cola was like booming. So Steve said, let's hire this guy. And he brought over John Scully into the, into the organization. And what happened next? Okay, they have a separate direction. Eh? Steve wants to go this way and John Scully wanted to go this way. So they fight. They fight in the board of directors, with the board of directors. And who do you think board of directors choose? John Scully, and then out you go, Steve Jobs. Okay, how do I explain this scenario with the theory that we explained just now? Steve Jobs have a very, quite low, quite high, but John Scully have a higher lead. So when they do battle, the person with the higher lead will always win. And that explains why Steve Jobs being kicked out. And then when Steve Jobs returned back, he learned, he grew himself, he became a better leader. And that's how he can kick out John Scully and the team out from Apple. Okay, so the only way for you to grow your organization, the only way for you to grow your chapter is to have a good leader. And there are two ways, which is to get one developed leader, or you yourself grow as a leader. Okay, that's the first one. Okay, the second one is the law of magnet. John Maxwell said that who you are is who you attract. Okay, how many of you have the person in the chapter that you don't like? <laughs> you think that these people are lousy? <laughs> oh, some of you. Or you think that these people is incapable of being in this chapter? Okay, some of you might have. And if, <laughs> look at this definition, eh? who you are is who you attract. If you are that kind of person, you will attract this kind of person. You will attract people same like you. And how you join a chapter is actually, maybe you are attracted to someone in that chapter. 
And if you, you attract lousy members, if you attracted lousy people to the chapter, and if they decided to stay, they decided to stay, so please do not blame that people. Try to look yourself in the mirror first, because of you may be one of the reasons. <laughs> okay. This is Aziata. Um, do you know the brand name Cellcom? How many of you use, use Cellcom here? Cellcom. Cellcom is owned by Aziata. And Dato Sri Jamaluddin was in one forum uh, shared about his experience of how did Aziata build their talent in the organization. So he mentioned that the moment you bring great people in the team, they will bring great people below them and so on and so forth. And the moment you bring a mediocre guy, they will bring a mediocre guy in the team and so on and so forth. So it is very important to have great people in your team and actually for you yourself to be a great person so that you can attract more and more great people. And let's talk about what is leadership actually. Just now is why. Why leadership is important. But now, let's talk. What is leadership? Okay, what is your definition of leadership? Anybody have definition of leadership? Influence. Influence, Influence exactly. John C. Maxwell said that leadership is Influence. The one word to explain leadership is influence. Okay, like the person, the example just now, the first person that you met, very highly, it is easier for this person to influence you, and it is easy for you to influence the person, the person B. Because uh, leadership is all about influence. The, uh, John Maxwell said that the true measure of leadership is influence. Nothing more, nothing less. So if you want to measure whether you are a good leader or you are a bad leader, if you say something but nobody listens to you, then you have a very low influential level. And if you are a great leader, you say something, people will start to listen to you. Even though what you are saying has no meaning. <laughs> okay, and then, what really makes a good leader? Okay, I've been searching about what really makes a great leader and out of all those leadership gurus, I found out that there's a very good definition about this guy, Rajiv Ishwaya. He's the CEO of Ikli Leadership and Governance Center. So he mentioned that leadership is somebody who has a burning desire to create a better future. Okay, what's the bold word then? Bold word is create a better future. So leadership is a leader who have, uh, someone who has a burning desire to create a better future. And you mentioned that what makes a good leader is not his or her position, her title, authority, but what he or she does, which is to create a better future. So if you look at any leaders in the world, they have one thing in common. They wanted to create a better future. So, if the definition of leadership is about creating a better future, so the moment you decided to create a better future, what you actually you, you, you need to do? You need to create what? You need to create change. That's what leadership is about, creating change. And what happened, the moment you said, I wanted to change. Okay, some of you may have mentioned this before. I wanted to create change, I want to change. Okay, what will happen? Register. What will happen? You said you want to change. Okay, how will people react when you say you want to change? Okay, maybe you are not so... Uh, you, you are a little bit... Uh, uh, big size, eh? And you say, I wanted to reduce my weight. What people say? Are you sure? Last year you said like that, so uh, nothing happened. Okay, the moment you wanted to create change, okay, the moment you say that I wanted to change, the world will offer nothing but resistance. resistance. If you say that today I think there is a problem and I wanted to change that, and the world will offer nothing but resistance. Okay, I still remember when I first joined BNI, I was uh, I was being called by one of my uh, ex schoolmate, which is Lydia. I don't know what is BNI is all about. I just started my business. I, I don't have a, even a proper structure, a proper business plan. And then I attended BNI. And I don't even really want to join BNI. But because of I see there is a good leader in that who said that 
we see a lot of BNI chapters, but we don't see a lot of Malay entrepreneurs in BNI chapters. So what's the problem? They analyze one of the problem is language barrier. And they say that they wanted to change. They wanted to change and let's do a Malay speaking chapter so that we can attract more Malay entrepreneurs to be in the in, in BNI system to get the benefits of BNI. And guess how the world react? Resistance! Can or not? Malay, no one, no Malay will work, will wake up at 7 a.m. and attend this kind of meeting when smart like this guy. Resistance, 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 resistance. But one thing I believe that they have is, because the key to leadership, according to Rajiv Pishwarya, is the key to leadership is to not give up in your attempt to create a better future. Because all of you, I think, you want to create something. You have something that you wanted to change. And the moment you want to change, you will find like what um, our previous speaker, Balakin, said. The moment you have goal, what you will see next is a wall, a barrier, challenges. And the key is actually to not give up in your attempt to create a better future. And until today, I think a lot of people from the Malay speaking community have got benefit from a decision made by these two, uh, two percent. Can, can we give a round of applause to them? Okay, let's talk about 21st century. Okay, we are now living in the which century? 21st century. Okay, let's uh, study history a little bit. Huh? I'm going to give you a little bit of history lesson. All of you study history, right? Yes. Study history. And I'm going to ask you some questions. Okay, if you look at um, the world, eh? 18th century, what happened during 18th century? Industrial revolution. Before that? Feudalism. Before that was the agriculture age. And during agriculture age, what do you think most people work as? Farmers, of course. That's the answer, eh? So I'll go to the answer is fun, eh? Okay, they work as a farmers. And to be a farmer, what are the one thing that you need to have as a person in order for you to become a good farmer? Sorry? Infrastructure? Deadline? Land! <laughs> okay, if you want to be a very good farmer, one thing that you need to have is physical power. Because of, if you have physical power, you have muscle, but the Malay people say, if you are sado, then you can produce more output. The stronger you are, the more effective you are as a farmer. But things have changed. In 19th century, what happened? There's industrial revolution, and now there is a industrial age. So a lot of people from farming, they went to town and they work as factory workers. Because of factory workers are in trend at that time. So when you, when you, at that time, if you were a factory worker, you can act a bit. Oh, you guys are a farmer, eh? I'm a factory worker, you know? In those days, those days, not today, eh? those days. And as a factory worker, what is important? You need what? I had some skills. We need skills. Because of, if you have skills, doesn't matter whether you have big muscle, whether you have strength, or you have physical power, that is no longer relevant because of in 19th century, if you've got skills, you can become more successful and you can earn more money. And things have changed. In 19th, 20th century, what happened? Information age. Things started to change and now, there are television, radio, and Internet. In the 20th century, we are talking about the baby internet. If some of you still can relate to this word, like <laughs> that kind of internet. How many of you? How many of you have that kind of experience? Wow, all of you live in, have lived in an information age. Okay, 20th century. Now knowledge is important. Now knowledge is important. Okay, what is important? How do you know someone is knowledgeable? They have what? They have experience. They have what? What? What will determine someone can be successful in the 20th century? Smart. How do you know someone is smart? 
education. They need a paper qualification. So in the 20th century, if you have diploma, or you know, you can walk a little bit, or have a diploma, you know. So confirm people will hire you to work. And someone else got degree. Oh, degree the, oh you got diploma, you got degree. And someone else got master. Oh, master, you can. And PhD, it's like you are like crying, you are not living in the real world. People who respect people who got a lot of information, a lot of knowledge. And that was 20th century and 21st century. What is important now? Now we are living in the 21st century. What what age is what age are we are we are in now? Okay, based on this book called A Whole New Mind, Daniel Pink said that now we are living in the conceptual age. Conceptual age. Okay, as much as as much as the physical power is no longer relevant in the 19th century, how much you know your paper qualification now is no longer relevant in the 21st century? Look at how many unemployed graduates are now. Last year in Malaysia, 190,000 out of 400,000 people unemployed are graduates. So your paper means nothing unless you have certain things that qualifies you to be successful in the 21st century. Okay, right now I want to share with you a little bit about 21st century. How, what does it take for you to become successful in the 21st century? Okay, in the 21st century, we call, uh, all those academicians, all those leadership gurus will use this term called VUCA. What is VUCA? How many of you have heard this word called VUCA? One. One only? Okay, well, two. Some of you. Okay, what is VUCA? What is VUCA? Okay, VUCA means volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. So meaning that whatever you predict tomorrow will happen, might not happen. Whatever you think that, okay, this will happen tomorrow, might not necessarily happen. Whatever safe, whatever secured, in today's world, might not be true tomorrow. 2008. How many of you uh, experienced in 2008? What happened in 2008? 2008, yes. 10 years ago. Lehman Brothers. Okay, Lehman Brothers. Eh? Lehman Brothers, uh, uh, financial crisis. Eh? Financial crisis uh, in the US, we call it subprime crisis. And Lehman Brothers. And it's one of the cause of the big crash. What happened is they give up loans for people to buy a house, including people who cannot afford to buy a house. And what happened is they serve, serve the loan. And what happened is the financial industry went shaky. And at that time, the CEO of Richard Falk, eh, the CEO of Lehman Brothers is, was Richard Falk. And Richard Falk had years experience in the banking industry. So we say that experience is important. This guy is the most experienced person in that organization. 30 years experience. But what happened? During that crisis, the Minister of Minister of Finance in the US, they called for a meeting. How do we save Lehman Brothers? The thing is, Richard Falk didn't even show up didn't even turn up to discuss. Why? Because they think that they are too big to fail. They cannot fail. It is impossible to fail because of they are too big. And a few days later, the Lehman Brothers, a big organization, giant organization, just declared bankruptcy and it just <laughs> collapsed. And that is what happens if you have bad leaders in your organization. So now we are in a VUCA world. It's a crazy world out there. If you think that you can sell this product for 10 years, the past 10 years, you can sell this product at 99 ringgit. And today we heard about $6. You see, it's US dollar you can buy from Alibaba. So that is the world that we are living right now. And we need a good leader to, for us to change, to predict what will happen next, and we need to change. And how are we going to be effective as a leader in the 21st century? 
Okay, there is a company called Aeon Hewitt. How many of you are fans of Manchester United? Yeah. Whoa! <laughs> how, how many of you uh, don't like Manchester United? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. That one is one out there. Okay. Manchester United, either you like, you like them or you hate them. There's no in between. Huh? <laughs> okay, Manchester United was sponsored by this company called Aeon. Few years, few years back, right? Okay, this company actually they did human capital consulting and they studied top companies for leaders. There are hundreds, thousands of companies that they studied and they identified top 25 of these companies where what which they call top companies for leaders. You can, you can download it for free. Yeah? Uh, this report is in 2015, Aeon Hewitt, top companies for leaders. And in this report, they identified that all of these top companies, they survive in the VUCA world and they have three common characteristics. How many characteristics? Three. three. And the first one is they have self-aware leaders. Leaders who know about themselves. Leaders who know about their purpose in life. Leaders who know about what they want and what they want to achieve. And also they know about their people around them. So that's the first one. The second one, they build resilience. Meaning that if they fall down, how fast they can stand up again. How, if they fail, how fast they can back up again. And the third one is, they identify and build engaged leaders. So the keyword is engagement. They create engagement. So these are the three characteristics that they find out in top companies for leaders. And these are the three things that we can learn from them and then we can apply in our organization, in our chapter, so that we can create a chapter that can survive in the book hour, that can uh, perform in the book hour. Okay, let's look one by one. Self-awareness. Okay, some of you might have watched, uh, seen this, this picture before. They said that for a fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam. Please climb that tree. So who will win? The monkey, the monkey for obvious reason. And what will happen to the rest? Struggle. Struggle. What will happen to the bird? They cannot climb. They can reach the tree fastest. But they cannot, the birds cannot climb, so it doesn't fit the criteria. What will happen to the elephant? Use the trunk to pull the tree. <laughs> okay, the elephant might just knock the tree down, and when the tree falls down, and then the elephant can straightway jump on the tree. Fulfill the criteria with damages happen. And what will happen to the fish? What will happen to the fish? Just look at <laughs> yeah? And that's why Albert Einstein mentioned so many years ago, everybody is a genius. All of us are genius, including you and me. All of us are genius. But if you charge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, you believe its own life believing that it is stupid. So please do not charge people just because they cannot perform certain tasks because they might be very, very good at another task. So the first key thing is actually to identify strength. What is your strength? Every one of us have certain strength, certain talent, that if you can make use of that strength, we can use them to our benefits of our organization. We can use certain people, because some people are very good with numbers. And people are very good with numbers, sometimes they are not very much excellent in terms of treating people. So where do we want to put this guy? In the NI chapter. Treasurer, ST, Secretary Treasurer. So we have to identify what are the strengths of these people and put them in the right position. Okay, in 2012, I am very fortunate to learn from this guy, Arthur Kamazi, one of the leadership guru. And I learned from him that we humans are hardwired differently. Some of us are hardwired in this way and some are deep in this way. And we have this um, uh, concept called colored brain where people just think differently. And because people think differently, people act differently, people behave differently. And the moment we think that all of these people are like me, and whatever I say they're supposed to understand, that is where problems happen in organization. The key is to identify who is doing good in doing what, who is not so good in doing what, and put them in the right place. The second one is about story. 
What's your story? Because all of us have our story, all of us have experience, and our experience shapes who we are today. Because our past is shaping our future. How many of you know Tony Fernandez? Only few of you? Do you know Tony Fernandez? Seriously? Okay, how many of you know Tony Fernandez? Okay, thank you. Okay, Tony Fernandez, uh, uh, what company did he create? AJ. He did not create the AJ. He did not, he, he did not uh, uh, invent the AJ. He bought from a company called DRB Highcom. Eh? And he lead this company and become one of the most successful organization for a low cost career. And why do you think he created low cost career? <laughs> so that everyone can fly. <laughs> okay, he got this very bad experience. When he was studying in the, in the UK, so he, he did uh, stay in UK for five years. And every time semester break, he cannot come back to Malaysia and he suffered. And he said that, why airline must be expensive? And from that moment, he said that, I'm not going to let this happen again. I want to create change. And let change by creating a low cost airline. And Asia is the result. So if I identify your story, you can know your purpose and you can clearly part, uh, chart your direction. Starbucks. How many of you know Starbucks? Have you drink Starbucks before? Yeah. Yes. Okay, who created Starbucks? Okay, Howard Schultz is the CEO of Starbucks. He, he, he's the one gentleman that responsible to grow Starbucks all around the world. He is, to me, is a very fantastic leader. But when he was a kid, there is one scenario that really impacted his life. When he was about five years old, he was playing at the, at the playground and suddenly his mother called him up. Howard, Howard, please come back! And then while he, run, he was running back uh, home and then he noticed that his father was just involved in an accident. Lying on the bed, half paralyzed. And he asked, what really happened? His father actually is a lorry driver and one day, his father involved in an accident and because of, he is a contract worker, not a permanent worker. So the company did not give the benefit of uh, permanent worker. So meaning that the hospitalization, insurance, nothing covered. And at the same time, his mother was pregnant for seven months. If some of you might have pregnant for seven months, you know how it feels, pregnant for seven months can't really apply for a new job. Nobody wants to hire you. So there goes a family. At that time, Ho Shop felt the pain because of the two, uh, the, the breadwinner of the, the, the family cannot work anymore. And he blamed because of the organization being irresponsible, treating his father, the employee like that. And he told himself that I'm not going to let this happen again. And when he runs Naba, he treated his employee like partner, so they call it partner. It's, in fact, the highest uh, cost to run Starbucks is to give benefits to their employees. So even though you are part time, you are still being covered. You are still being given all those facilities as, as a uh, permanent employee. So that's how it uh, impacted Starbucks. So same goes with me. I was an engineer, and as an engineer. I noticed that I don't like being an engineer. How many of you studied engineering but did not become an engineer? Okay, some of you. Maybe you can relate with how I felt. <laughs> okay, the question. People ask me a question. Johan, you, if you know you don't want to become an engineer, why are you spending five years studying engineering? So how do I answer that? I think that is the wrong question. Okay, uh, okay wh why, why did I, I study five years and study engineering? Because of, I, I, I know I want to become a speaker, but I study engineering. Why? Okay, actually, when I was in Form 4, my counselor gave me this code, uh, this, this test, personality test called Holland Code. How many of you have heard this Holland Code test? Some of you, personality test, eh? It uh, identifies what career suits you. And as I answered answer the question and calculate the, the, the score, I noticed that I am an artistic person. 
And he's like, ah, no wonder I like to draw when I was a kid. I like to sing. I like to play guitar. In fact, when I learned how to play guitar when I was in Form 2, within two weeks, I can play better as compared to the person that taught me how to play guitar. <laughs> That's how good I am. Makes sense. I'm an artistic person. An artistic person, I suppose, to become an artist. But few weeks before, a uh, uh, few months before SPM, the same counselor, the same counselor that gave me that test in an assembly, I was sitting um, at one of the seat there, and then the, the counselor standing behind the podium, he said that we want all of you to become successful because of we want you to become a worker that contribute to the nation. And since we are in a science school, the government has paid for our expenses. We want to create a future science worker. We want to create future scientists, we want to create engineers, we want to create architects. We are not here to create artistic people. And Boma said, oh, we are not here to create artistic people. And I was sitting down there, listening, and I felt like, a bow hurts into my heart. It's like, oh my god, I can't really be who I am. And then that moment I decided, okay, let's do engineering. And that decision makes me suffer for the next five years. <laughs> plus three years of working as an engineer. And now I already found what I truly wanted to become, which is I love performing. I love to stand on stage. In, in, in university, I love to play guitar and perform on stage. This is what I truly wanted to become. And to relate to my past story, actually, I noticed that a lot of people did not live to their potential because of they don't know who they are. And they did all these personality tests, but they did nothing about the personality tests. They just know, oh, I'm this type, I'm this type. But they did not make decisions on themselves based on what they find out. So that is being my life mission now. Okay, this is the whole input. Okay, so, um, and Socrates said long time ago, first, you must know thyself, know yourself. Know yourself, be true to yourself, um, know your word and be true to who you are at your best. Because of all of us born with certain strength. All of us are genius. And we need to utilize our genius so that we can perform at the highest level. And that's what makes great leaders. Because leaders, they utilize their strength. And they don't not, not focus too much on their weaknesses. So that's the first one, self-awareness. Okay, the second one is resilience. Being resilient. Resilience is about trying something new and accept the notion of failing fast. Try something new and you fail, get back up again and try again and try again and try again. They identify that people who are really resilient is one of the key characteristics to become successful in the 21st century. In 2011, we did this program called Prestige Leadership Program. Our client pays us about half a million ringgit to run a leadership program, and I was appointed as the coordinator. So we hired all those uh, lecturers and from different universities to talk about leadership, to train about leadership. And after about 11 days of training programs with two uh, very prominent keynote speech, we noticed that this lecturers doesn't really know what leadership is all about. And that created a lot of frustration to me. And I noticed that that program doesn't work. And I started to ask myself, so what leadership is all about? And I started to learn from all these books, I watched videos, I attended seminars, I've learned from the, the, the best person that I can find on earth through YouTube and things like that. And then I found this guy named Robin Sharma. And he said in his book, Leader Who Have No Title, he said that you don't need a title to be a leader. You don't need a title to be a leader. Because all of us can decide at any point of our life, when we decide we want to do something, we want to change something, that is the point that we become a leader. So you don't have to become MC members, president, or any other kind of position in order for you to declare yourself as a leader. You are, you are already a leader if you decide to be a leader. And leadership is about passion. Steve Jobs, 
before he passed away, 2007, he said that we have to have a lot of passion in what we were doing because of it is so hard. To do this work is so hard that any rational people will give up. So understanding your big why is one of the ways for you to not give up in your attempt to create a better future. And when you want to decide about something, you have to really understand yourself because of if you are so much passionate and it is very much into you, um, you it is it's easy for you to get back. Eh? Um, my my guru, Atta F. Kamali, said that when you make a choice, decide based on your identity, not your environment. Because your your environment changes, but your identity identity will remain constant. So no matter what happened, if I, why I became engineer because of that time, that is the in thing, the trend. Okay, I live in the, during the the, uh, the era of Tun Mahathir. So Tun Mahathir said, we need a lot of engineers, we need a lot of engineers. So when I graduated, Pak Lah comes to the office. So Pak Lah comes to the office, okay, we need more pertanian adalah perniagaan. So we need more planters. So what happened to engineers like me? So I make decision because of environment, and environment changes. And when the environment changes, you just can't do anything. But if I decided I wanted to be a performer from the from, from my very young age, no matter what happened to the environment, I will still be resilient. I still wanted to make things happen. So that is something that I learned from Ante Kamazi. Look at Sichiro Honda. How many of you drive Honda here? Any Honda? Honda? Some of you. Honda, how of three? Honda really lives with his dream. Since he was a kid, he really loved all these technical things. He really loved deal with engines. So he invented this piston ring. And he said to his wife, I wanted to really um, commercialize this piston ring. So he met with Toyota, proposed the design. Toyota said, okay, let's make some prototype, send it to us, and we will evaluate. So the moment he sent the first batch, what do you think the response from the Toyota? Bam! Jack Tan. So we went back again, redo, 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 and send back again. Second time, ding, pass. And pass, he got a PO to produce mass production. So he invested everything that he had, including his wife, jewelry, and everything, to start to build his manufacturing company. And as the company progressing, they goes World War II. And his factory being bombed. Not once, but twice. Boom! Everything is right, build up again. Boom! Everything is right, build up again. And earthquake happens. Boom! Third time fail. By this time, any rational people will just give up. But because of Honda, it's not rational. Honda is a crazy guy. And because of he decided he still wanted to pursue his dream. Because that is his passion. That is who we are as a, at the core. So he decided that no matter what it is, I still wanted to pursue. And during the end of World War II, he noticed that a lot of people riding bicycle. And with his piston engine, can put on the bicycle and create a motorbike. And that is I started to mention up. Honda Cup, yes, Honda Cup, and Honda Cup is one of the successful product that started of the uh, company of Honda, and the rest is history. So, if you are now you are you are driving Honda Civic or Honda uh, Accord or uh, City, so you have to stand to Honda because he didn't quit, and you got the benefit of driving Honda right now. And James Dyson, how many of you know Dyson, yeah. Brent Dyson? Okay, Dyson is to me is one of the most innovative company. I have a for, uh, I'm very fortunate because of I have uh, the opportunity to train Dyson. And when I heard about the country Dyson, I think they are next to Apple. They are just like Apple, innovative company. And Dyson, he have a problem. One day he vacuumed his uh, his house and he noticed that the bag is was full. And then he went to the shop to buy a bag. The vacuum in the bag. And the, the, the guy said that, I'm sorry, this is an absolute model. We don't have this bag. 
And you create a lot of frustration. And you see that, like everyone, we get frustrated that the product that don't work properly. But he decided to do something about it. And that's where he decided to create a bagless vacuum cleaner. And how they create it? Because of when you are in so much into a problem and you want to find a solution, you will start to notice everywhere about the solution. So he went to a wood mill, and there is a technology called cyclone. Cyclone is a technology where there's a lot of dust in the factory, and this cyclone can take out all the dust uh, through some, some uh, vacuum, so that you will separate the dust into uh, one way and the air into another way. So the, the air outside is a clean air, but the dust is trapped into a certain thing, uh, certain uh, area. So that is what exactly Dyson did. He took up that concept of cyclone, brought it into labs, and tested again and again and again and again and again up to 5,127 prototypes in the period of five years. He failed and tried again and tried again and tried again and tried again and finally he succeeded. And now, Dyson is the richest man in UK. He owns more land as compared to the Queen of England. That's how much rich he is. What makes him very successful? Because of he did not give up in his attempt to create a better future. Okay, now. Let's do some activities because I saw some of you started to nodding your head, showing that you agree with me. <laughs> okay, let's do some activities. Uh, to make you up a bit. Okay, um, I would like you to get a partner, get a partner, get a partner, get a partner. Okay, get a partner. Um, okay, can you decide one partner is partner A and one partner is partner B? Okay, can you decide partner A and partner B? Okay, wait, partner A, can you please raise your hand? Partner A, please raise your hand. And partner B, please raise your hand. Okay, partner A, what I want you to do is to hold a fist. Hold a fist. Hold a fist, partner A. Gengam kan tangan anda, partner A. So, it's this activity called open your fist. Okay, open your fist. Okay, partner A, you will hold your fist. Okay, partner B, what will you do? Open the fist. Okay, I'm going to give you about 10 seconds. And partner B, please try to open your partner A's fist. I'm going to give you about 10 seconds. And 10 seconds begins now. Okay, how many of you, how many of partner B managed to open partner A, please? Okay, how many of you did not uh, manage to open your partner A's face? Okay, thank you. Okay, those who win, what is your secret? What is your secret of success? Tickle! <laughs> Good strategy. Anyone else, can you share with me? What's your strategy like? Give one dollar! Wow! Anybody else want to share your strategy? Your strategy? Ask! Ask! Okay! Okay, let's look at How many of you use, really use force? Use force? Most of you. Okay, how many of you tickling? <laughs> tickling? Or use some kind of distraction? Okay, how many of you bright? Want to drink it? And how many of you just ask an A, A person to open the hand? Okay, which one is the, best, the easiest way? To ask, right? Okay, how many of you failed today? You, you failed in this activity, but you learned something. Okay, that is the effect of failure. When we fail, doesn't mean that we're going to fail all the, all the time. Because once you fail, you learn something. In fact, you learn something, uh, you learn better as compared to those who have succeeded. And today, uh, tomorrow, if someone else did this kind of activity, you already learn what to do. You already know what to do. 
Uh, so he said, fail fast and cheap, fail often and fail in a way that it doesn't kill you. Because of what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Thank you. Okay, the third element of uh, leading a 21st century is deal and engage, engage leaders, identify and engage leaders. Okay, engaging leaders have these three characteristics. They are the mobilizer. Mobilizer means that they are the ones who take initiative, give out ideas and started, started things. Second rule is they are the stabilizer. Stabilizer when people started to quarreling, they are the ones that stabilize it. Make sure things, are, things went smooth. Okay, the third one is ambidextrous. Okay, what is ambidextrous? By definition, ambidextrous is your ability to use left and right hand, right. both hands, both left and right hand. But metaphor metaphorically, in this report, they mentioned that the ability to use left brain and right brain, using both brain, not only to think logically, but also to, to think emotionally. In other words, emotional intelligence is part of a big thing in this 21st century. So you have to understand people. Because if you don't understand people, you cannot engage with people. Because someone said, said, when people are financially invested, they wanted a return. If they invest, you invest in them, in RM, they wanted return. But if you invested emotionally, they just want to contribute. So if you engage them emotionally, they will contribute whatever it takes for the chapter. Have you ever had a president or a boss that engage you so much that you said, I will do whatever it takes beyond the ring game. And I will do whatever it takes to make sure it is successful. This is what we mean by engaging emotionally, by some incident. So you can uh, engage extrinsically and intrinsically. Intrinsically is using your internal thing. Extrinsic is external. External, most of the time, is based on rewards. Intrinsic is more of emotion. One of the key things is appreciate. Started to appreciate. Okay, let's do it this quickly. Let's appreciate someone who is sitting next to you. Okay, can you say something positive, something good about the person who sits next to you?